This episode is called Rumper and the Blind Tasting because it's about wine. Of course, Rumpel's favourite wine is what he gets from Pomeroy's wine bar. He either calls it Chateau Thames Embankment or Chateau Fleet Street, and it's a pretty, pretty crude and ordinary sort of claret. But Erskine Brown is a great wine buff and can tell the years and the vintages of all the rarest wines. And he goes lecturing Rumpel about wine. And Rumpel says, well, you know, the chief purpose of wine, so far as I'm concerned, is to make you slightly drunk. And I don't know well, how important all these ancient vintages are. But the, uh, the story is about uh, vintage wine and a vintage wine merchant and a Rumpel a meeting at a blind tasting and a wine expert who is played by Phyllida Law, Emma Thompson's mother, and an insurance claim which a, a wine dealer is making for what he says is the loss of a great quantity of very fine wine stolen by the members of the Timpson family. This episode introduces a new young barrister into Chambers. She's called Liz Probert. She's played at this stage by Samantha Bond very well. Liz Probert is the acme of political correctness and of, uh, of the new of women's rights, women's lib, political correctness of every sort. So that uh, although Rumpole gets her into Chambers and... Uh, has a ruse to get her into chambers, they do become enemies or will come in conflict at times during the stories to come because of the political correctness of Liz Probert. There is a scene which you will enjoy when Rumpel is demonstrating a, a little bit of murder technique and uh, Hilda's best friend, Dodo McIntosh, comes suddenly into the room and thinks that Rumpel is misconducting himself with this same Liz Probert something which doesn't, of course, endear him to the formidable Hilda. Frozen peas, are you, Timson? What's the matter with that? He likes his chips and peas. Throw it out, cos they... This go well with your chips too, does it? Chart-topping carboy. Members of the jury, an Englishman's freezer is his castle. Surely he is entitled to put anything he likes in it. Anything he may have bought cheaply from a man offering articles for sale in the public house. Not dropped off the back of a lorry. My lord, during the entire course of this case, there has been absolutely no evidence concerning lorries. Of course, Mr. Rumpel. This was the unknown man in the pub, wasn't it? There have been cases of receiving stolen property in this building before, you know. I'm sure you've been engaged in a good many of them. As I was saying, uh, members of the jury, uh, people with something particularly valuable to protect uh, often put them in strange places. And many of us may have had aunts who were in the habit of hiding pound notes in the tea caddy, burying them deep in the Darjeeling, and thus running the risk of boiling up their small savings for their elevenses. Mr. Rumpel, your aunt is not evidence. That is your lordship's ruling. Of course it is. Then in my most humble submission, your lordship is absolutely right. Ignore aunts, members of the jury. This case must be decided strictly on the evidence. And where in this case, let us ask, is there proof that this is in fact stolen property? Uh, is there not uh, 
Detective Inspector Bell. Ah, yes, the enthusiastic D.I. who regards convictions uh, with as much pride as the late Don Giovanni regarded his conquests of the female sex. No doubt he notches them up on his braces. <laughs> A Detective Inspector Bellman has said that there have been burglaries of George and Silver in certain country houses in Kent, but members of the jury... Not one householder has been called to identify this property as his or to say that it was stolen from him. Mr. Lovko, do you intend to address this jury at your usual length? I intend to do my duty, my lord, in the best interest of my client. 10.30 tomorrow morning, members of the jury. And uh, when considering this case, you will put entirely out of your minds anything Mr. Rumpel may have told you about his curious family. I expect our relatives know the proper place for their valuables. In the back. Oh, How can you drink that stuff? I'll show you. You raise the glass to the lips, you tilt the head slightly backward, and you let the liquid trickle down gently past the tonsil. Like that. Of course, I've had an awful lot of practice, but even you'll come to it in time. Well, of course, you can drink it. I mean, presumably it's possible to drink methylated spirits, shaken up with a little ice and a dash of Angostura bitters. That's a fair description. The point is, why should you want to? Forgetfulness, Erskine Brown. Consignment of the sepulchral Judge Graves to the Lethe of Forgotten Things. He has Judge Bullingham's pernicious habit of constantly interrupting my address to the jury. Oh, I'm defending an alleged receiver of stolen sugar bowls. Is he guilty? Hugh uh, Snake Legs Timpson inherited the family fencing business when his Uncle Percy retired to live in Benidorm. Well, then, why worry? Because there is no evidence that the stuff was stolen. But the lugubrious Judge Graves has put the kiss of death on the presumption of innocence. Oh, well. Thank you, Edith. Chalk it up, would you please? Of course, there is another reason why I drink Pomeroy's plonk. Can't be the colour. Who cares about the colour? Not to put too fine a point on it, if you drink enough of this stuff, you stand a good chance of getting blotto. Horace, good heavens. The purpose of wine is not to get you blotto. You astonish me. It's to taste sunlight trapped in a glass. To remember some green slope in Burgundy, or a village by the Giron. I dare say there is a patch of barren soil in some corner of a foreign field where the Fleet Street grape struggles for existence. Probably somewhere between a cow shed and a piece well. The nose, Rumpel. What? The nose? I beg your pardon. It's terrible. Because we disagree about Pomeroy's plonk, there's no reason to descend to personal abuse. From her. My nose may not be a thing of beauty and a joy forever. Now, look here. But in its youth, it may have had a certain tip tilted charm. My and dear I'm Horace. quite willing to admit that in its latter years, it may have put on a little weight. You misunderstand. But at least my nose doesn't make me look like a constipated goss or... But I don't mean your nose, Rumpel. I mean the wine's nose. Oh, don't babble, as it were. Nose signifying bouquet. Now... It's one of the expressions we use in wine law, together with length. Well, the length of this looks to be about one inch and shrinking rapidly. The length of time a fine wine lingers on the palate. Mm. Now, look here. Why don't you let me educate you? My friend, Martin Vanbury, organises tastings in the city. Blind tastings. Blind? Are they? Sounds exactly what I need. Lead me to them. Got to cheer myself up somehow. We're getting a verdict tomorrow. Customers don't like it, you see. They may think we're making secret deals. We don't stereotype that much, do we, Mr. Rumpel? And you don't call me Mr. Rumpel. I thought you were much too busy fighting the class war to care about outdated behaviour patterns. Fighting what? Protecting working people from middle class judges. <laughs> the Timpsons would hate to be called working people. They are entirely middle class villains. And they're very conservative, too, as a matter of fact. They live according to strict monetarist principles and the free market economy. Oh, and they're dead against the closed shop. They believe shops should be open all hours of the night, preferably with a jemmy. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, brilliant. I sat in and it all seemed hopeless. 
But you got him off. You know why? None of the owners would identify their silver. They'd received the insurance money, you see. They were doing very nicely. Thank you. Last thing on earth they wanted was to get their old sugar bowls back and have to return the money. Life's a bit more complicated than they teach you at the bar exams, Miss B. But he was innocent. Well, let's say there wasn't enough evidence to convict him. Look, Grandpa, can you give me some counselling, career-wise? Uh, not now, I'm afraid, Miss Brewer, but I have a blind date with some rather attractive bottles of wine. Oh, uh, another quaint old tradition of the bar, Miss Probert. Members only, I'm afraid. I'm Martin Vandery. Welcome to the shop. Uh, Horace Rumpel. Oh, the legal eagle. You came here with Collie, didn't you? Claude Eskin Brown, yes. We used to call him Collie at school. Oh, after the dog. No, after the doctor, Hollis Brown. Claude was a bit of a pill at Winchester. We had to kick him around a bit. How frightfully decent of you. Look, I'd better get the show on the road. Uh, uh, Bill, uh, come on through. Bill. Bernie, I'm lovely to see you. I'm glad you're here. You don't call me. Hello there, nice to see you. Right. Uh, uh, gather around, everybody. Uh, gather around. Well, I, I think you all know the rules. Uh, it's as easy as musical chat. The wrong guesses get knocked out as we go along until there are just two players and one superb bottle of wine left. And my decision is final. Oh, dear. Good afternoon, Mr. Mantis. Afternoon, all. Right, bring on the antifreeze. Let's get warmed up. I'll just hang you for a while. I can't imagine why Martin invites him to these dudes. Hardly your typical connoisseur. Impossibly common little man. Knows a lot about wine. Yes. Buys a lot, Martin tells me. I suppose you do pretty well out of a garage in Blue. Oh. Um, Honoré Bert, wine correspondent of the Sunday Examiner. Oh, Horace Rumpel, barrister at law. Ah. Uh, can we begin now? Suits me. Let the battle commence. Come back for seconds, can we? Hardly. A beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrene. Comparing this to Chateau Fleet Street is like comparing a planning appeal in the House of Lords to an indecent exposure before the Uxbridge magistrates. It's just over there, expectoration corner. I see you haven't swallowed it, have you? You must be a new boy. Uh, well, uh, Rumbell, your first shot. Yes. What is it, Horace? Oh, well, it's outside my price range for start. Outside his price range. Have a guess. Oh, I'd say uh, at least ten quid a bottle. <laughs> oh, He's <laughs> out. Yes, I'm afraid you're out. <laughs> Mr. Mantis? Uh, Poyak, Lange bars, possibly. 75, 76. Fit under the age of consent. Tasty little snug, but not quite right for your actual dirty weekend. Know what I mean? <laughs> Inexpressibly vulgar. Everybody agree? Come along, Martin. When are you going to give us something difficult? Why, number two coming up. Mr. Rumpo, let me give you a glass of Vanbury's Ordinaire. It's a consolation prize. Oh, splendid. I don't have to spit it out, do I? Uh, Collie. I seem to taste... Avignon, um, the Chateau Neuf du Pal, uh, uh, 79, possibly. Uh, what do you say, Bertie? Something perhaps a little more, um, southerly? Australian. Kunawara, probably around 81. Well done, Bertie. <laughs> That's <all right>. <laughs> <laughs> Bed down by the nose, old darling. Are. Not very fair, really. One always forgets about the colonies. The final round, and something quite remarkable. Good. 
Gordon Bennett. When I said bring on the antifreeze, you really took me seriously, didn't you? Well, Betty, <coughs> let me uh, give you a clue, Betty. Uh, it's not whiskey. I think I guessed that. But think, Betty. Think of whiskey translated. Try Johnny Mobile. Equine whiskey, Betty. Equine. Hmm? White horse. Very good. Conservative, too. Uh, on the right. On the right. Uh, mm. The right bank of the river, Santa Million. That's not White Horse exactly. Chiffon Blanc. 1971, I'm afraid. Nothing earlier. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Bertie. Oh, Still an unbeatable <laughs> palette. Oh, I'm sorry you got fit for the face, Mr. Mantis. Uh, you did jolly well. Come with me, Bertie. Uh, oh, remember, oh, what we you say? Here's yet another certificate of the Grand Contest on your band. And a complimentary bottle of the Gibbous Chambertin Claire Dow. Is that you, Ron Hill? No! It's the man come to tune the harp. Oh dear. You do seem in a funny mood tonight, Ron Hill. Seen, madam? Nay, it is. I know not seen. Is not alone my inky cloak, good Hilda, nor customary suits of solemn black, nor windy suspiration of coarse breath, no, nor the fruitful river in the eye. As a matter of fact, I want to finish today. Yes, I thought you might have. That's why you're so full of yourself. Oh, you like me better when I lose. At least you're quieter. And I went to a wine tasting. Oh, don't you always? Oh, Hilda, ha ha. No, I do it by instinct. Claude Erskine Brown's giving me lessons in it. But he ought to have something better to do, now that he's got family. Now, Hilda, you're a woman of considerable experience, aren't you? I don't know what you mean. I mean, you can tell margarine from butter. Of course. You wouldn't have any doubts about it, would you? I mean, not like those idiot women on television. Of course not. Although, if the margarine was labelled fresh dairy butter, and you had just been told that it came straight from the cow... Rumpo, I'm glad you're feeling so full of yourself Why tonight. Why should want to wrap margarine in butter packets? I've got a bit of news for you. Well, for those poor unfortunates that have to guess which washing powder makes their undies whiter. <laughs> My old school friend, Dodo McIntosh, is coming to stay for a few days. She's very keen to see you in action at the Old Bailey. And I don't think that she'd appreciate you talking about undies very much. They always look so afraid they're going to disappoint the interviewer. <laughs> what did you say? Church Times, Rumpel. Well, only for the racing tips. First class fellow writing on legal matters. Well, Canon Probert. Mm -hmm. This week's piece is headed Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Oh, do look out, Ballard, and get in the Church Times in my egg and fried slice. Too often, the crafty lawyer frustrates the angel of retribution. Too often, the angel of retribution makes a complete balls up of the burden of proof. What we need in chambers is someone with the spirit of Canon Probert. Someone to convince the public that lawyers still have a remnant of moral fibre. Probert? Did you say Probert? Canon of Worsfield. God, why is that name so familiar? Liz Probert, about my application to be a pupil in Chambers. He wants one too, Diane. I do keep telling you, Miss Probert, it'll come before the pupillage committee in the normal course. Pupil? One of your pupil? Any good at cutting, are you? Do you have to be? Well, my old pupil master, C.H. Wisdom, awfully nice chap, but he never gave me anything to do. So I became the best fellow in chambers at getting his balls in the waste paper basket. Awfully good training, you know. I never had an enormous practice. Well, I had very little practice at all, is the truth, you know. So I was able to concentrate on my golf, you see. Now, if you want to be a pupil, my advice to you is get yourself a machine in blick. Just taking this to Mr. Rumpel. Oh, look, don't bother. I'll do it. Where is he? First door on the right. Oh, let her go, Diane. 
Better than her hanging round the clerk's room, holding up our work. What's the, um, what's the law on the subject? Uh, what's the, uh, uh, what? The law? On the doctrine of impossible attempts. Hasn't the House of Lords just had something new to say about it? Oh, the House of Lords are always saying something. A bunch of old chatterboxes, if you want my opinion. Thank you. <laughs> yes, but you must know the case. Oh, must I? Well, yes, I mean, there have been all these articles about it in the uh, Criminal Law Review. Oh, my favourite bedtime reading. So you know the House of Lords' decision? I know it, of course I know it. The long winter evenings at Froxbury Mansions, we talk of little else. But good heavens, the name is on the tip of my tongue. Uh, Swinglehurst? Oh, yes, yeah, Swinglehurst. There we are at my fingertips, as usual. Uh, Mr. Bernard, here we are. The doctrine of uh, impossible attempt examined. Uh, the Queen against Dewdrop distinguished. Yes, good stuff, Mr. Bernard. Fine, rich prose. So, how does that affect Tony Timpson trying to steal three non-existent television sets? Ah, yes, indeed. How does it? Yes. I think a written opinion would be uh, of more use to you, uh, Mr. Bernard. There are other authorities that uh, I may have to consult in depth. Oh, I should be enormously grateful. Oh, think nothing of it, Mr. Bernard. Uh, nothing of it. All part of the Rumpole service. <laughs> Bye. How on earth... I was just passing. I'll do that opinion for you. Oh, you know a bit of law, do you? Top student of my year if you want the statistic. I must confess that after a lifetime at the bar, I have very little interest in the law. Give me a blood stain or two, a bit of disputed typewriting, a couple of hairs on a cardigan, you can keep your House of Lords decisions. Look, Rumpole, my application is in before the pupillage committee. Oh, you want to join our gallant band of brothers here in Equity Court, do you? I just hope they don't all suffer from standard male reflexes. Miss Probert, is your father a canon of the Church of England who writes a great deal of nonsense about legal matters? Oh, don't answer this. I mean, has this head of chambers got a sexist attitude toward women barristers? <laughs> Dear old Sam Ballard is ridiculously prejudiced against young women whose fathers are not canons of the Church of England, so I'd keep very quiet about it if I were you. We had a girl in chambers called Fiona Always. Yes, she married a merchant banker and went to live in Cheltenham. <laughs> Just as soon as you teach them to take a decent note in court, they marry a merchant banker and go and live in Cheltenham. Elizabeth Probert? Probert, yes. I suppose she might have a certain elfin charm without her glasses. I wonder if she'd care to help with my county court practice. That's all you think about, Erskine Brown. Wine, women and your county court practice. Now, that is distinctly unfair. And as I said before, I'm not sure that we want any new intake in chambers. I mean, is there enough work to go round? I speak as a member with daughters, daughters to support. You know, thinking the matter over, I think Philida might be rather against her. Mm. Probert, Probert. Isn't that the name of your favourite writer on church affairs? Canon Probert? Yeah. Is she some relation? Well, she hasn't denied it. Oh, well, in that case... In what case? Elizabeth Probert comes from a family with enormously sound views on the religious virtue of retribution as part of our criminal law. I see her as an admirable pupil for Rumpo. You don't think that he might teach her some of his um, courtroom antics? I think she might, just possibly, be his salvation. Keep the old Cortina in the drive now, then, do you? I think they're leaving that there, are you? What's the matter? Garage full, is it? Mm -hmm. Keys? Um, well, I can't quite put my hands on them for a bit. All right, hope not. Oh, no, I can't. 
Fancy a drop of this to go with your chips and peas, do you, Timson? Rumpole! Excuse me, sorry. Where are you going? Into a conference in Brixton. Well, I'll give you a lift. I've got a car. I'm coming with you. Why? Mr. Ballard just told me. I passed the committee and I've been given to you. To me? As a pupil. Didn't mean it to go as far as that. I can look up the law. Oh, for heaven's sake, we won't need the law. Take some kind of a rudimentary note, can you? Just tell Mr. Rumpel why you had all that wine in your garage. Nothing to do with you coming from a broken home, was it? Broken home? What are you talking about? Mum and Dad was married 40 years. He never so much as looked at another woman. What do you want about this? Just setting Miss Probert's mind at rest. All right, Snake Legs. How come your garage was used as a cellar for fine wines? A couple of good stuff, is it? Didn't you taste it? See, total me. You know that, Mr. Rumpel. Well, uh, the wife, well, she will have a glass of tawny port at Christmas. I, th I think it's right, you understand. It's a drink that leads to crime. We all know that, don't we, Mr. Rumpel? But where did you get it? The judge might be curious to know. Well, there was this fellow I happened to bump into. Um, Not in a pub. Three lines in Bromley. Well, how did you guess? Are you psychic or something, Mr. Rumpel? Oh, please, Snake Lake, let's have a little variation. Judge Graves is getting terribly bored with that story. Graves? You're not having him again, are we? Not if I can help it. All right, so you bought all these crates of stuff from this fella in a pub. Who's got a list of the exhibits? Thank you, Miss Prowitt. Don't happen to remember his name by any chance, do you? Cheval Blanc Saint Emilion. No, 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 no. It was nothing like that. Uh, something um, more Irish. Um... Chances, Mr. Rumble. <laughs> You've heard of snowballs in hell? You were right about me last time. Last time the losers didn't come forward and claim their property. Because of the insurance? Miss Probert remembers. This time the loser of the wine is the principal witness for the prosecution. Martin Vanbury. Of Vanbury's purveyors of fine wines, Prentice Alley, City of London? Yes. Not a particularly attractive character. The highly respectable public school bully. Where are we going now? Ah, we are going to see a witness. I thought we weren't allowed to see witnesses. Ah, we're allowed to see this one. This one is an expert. And we're allowed to see experts. Oh, Daddy buy you this little runabout, did he? Present from the cannon. My Daddy isn't a cannon. Oh, hush, hush, Miss Robert. What is he exactly? What's he do? Well, he's the Labour leader of the North London Council. Not Red Rock present. No. <laughs> oh, dear. Don't tell I've learned a dead of champions then, will you? Promise. Promise. It's always nice to meet a genuine enthusiast, Mr. Rumpel. Uh, I've been wondering about your your qualifications as a connoisseur. I mean, where you got your training? Training? Day trip to Boulogne. With the loot and secondary modern. <laughs> God, you should have seen us. What a scruffy bunch of kids we were. All acne and lavatory jokes. Enough to drive Sir Watt to us into the funny farm. 
We're always off trying to give him the slip, you know, chasing non-existent girls. And when we caught them, they were fatter and spottier than the local talent around the Wimpy Bar. <laughs> well, I ended up in the station Buffy for some unknown reason. And I spent what I'd been saving for an unavailable knee trembler. If you'll pardon my French, Miss Probert. And I bought half a bottle of wine. I don't know what it was. Ordinaire de la Gare. French Railway's perpetual standby. One taste, that was hooked. When you've been brought up on fizzy drinks, a taste of old pennies and sweet tea that you could stand a spoon up in. I tell you, that wine became a bit of a revelation, Mr. Rumpole. You know, I used to keep a cellar under my bed. <laughs> and I shared it out with special friends in tooth mugs. All right, is it? Somewhat better than the Cheval Blanc round Vanbury's. <laughs> Dramatics going. Oh, we're giving private lives next month. Miss Osgood takes the Gertie Lawrence role. Miss Osgood, the lady in charge of the court lists down the old bailey. Yes, Mr. Rumpel. Uh, could I put you down for a couple of seats? Orchestra stalls, Henry, the very best the town hall can provide. And uh, next time you're chatting with Miss Osgood during rehearsals, now that Judge Bullingham is out of the way for a bit, holidaying, I believe, with some chums in Pamplona, it is vital that the latest Timpson receiving case does not get before the White Senator. Who, hey, sir? The funereal Judge Graves, second only in horror to the mad bull himself. I understand Judge Molesy is sitting next week, sir. Molesy, a daddy will come to judgment. Oh, if you're right for this, Judge, I'll have old Molesy eating out of my hand, as mild and mannered as an old darling has ever thought in terms of probation. Oh, probation is receiving still a while. With old Moldy, I wouldn't be at all surprised. A fortnight's community service is his equivalent of a sentence in the galley. Mr. Rumble. He's a real old sweetheart. Judge moldy has got a severe cold. Cold? Can't the old fool wrap up warm? We'll transfer you to another judge, Mr. Rumpole. Another judge? What do you mean? <laughs> Mr. Rumpole, do you wish to detain this gentleman in the witness box? Well, just for a little while, my lord. You have questions for him? One or two, my lord, yes. Is there any dispute that your client had this gentleman's wine in this possession? No dispute about that, my lord, no. Then to what issue in this case will your questions be directed? If you sit there quietly for a minute or two, old darling, you might just possibly find out. They will be directed to the issue of my client's guilt or innocence, my lord, a matter which may be of some interest to the jury. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Martin Vanbury, I take it that your wine you lost uh, was insured? Well, of course. I had it fully insured. As a prudent businessman. I hope I am that, my lord. I'm sure you are, Mr. Jackson. I'm perfectly sure you are. How long have you been uh, trading as a wine merchant in Prentice Alley in the city of London? Well, just three years, my lord. Before that, where were you trading? By selling pictures. As a matter of fact, I had a shop in Chelsea. We specialised in 19th century watercolours, my lord. Mm. The name of the business? It was Banbury Fine Arts. Why, Mr. Bernard? you managed to find any insurance claims for Vanbury Fine Arts yet? No, not yet. We're still looking, Mr. Rumpel. Only one thing to do. Mr. Jamble. I must put it to you that Vanbury Fine Arts made a substantial insurance claim in respect of the premises in the King's Road. There was a serious break-in and most of our stock was standard. Thank God for that. Of course, I had to make a claim, my lord. Of course. You seem to be rather prone to serious break-ins, Mr. Vanbury. It is the rising tide of lawlessness that threatens to engulf us all. You should know that better than anyone, Mr. Rumpel. Usher, could I have a bottle from exhibit number four, please? Exhibit number four? That's part of the wine. Yes, my lord. You're not proposing to sample it, I hope, Mr. Rumpel. I do not make application to do so at this moment, my lord. Uh, Mr. Vanbury, you say that this bottle contains a fine claret of vintage quality? It does, my lord. Retailing at what price? Ah, oh, I think around £50 pounds a bottle. And insured for? I believe we insured it for the retail price. Such a wine would be hard to replace, my lord. Of course it would. It's a particularly fine vintage of the uh, 
Uh, what did you say first? Uh, Cheval Blanc. Cheval Blanc. But we all know what we have to pay for a fine burgundy nowadays, don't we, members of the jury? Uh, it's a claret, my lord. Claret. Yes, it, it, it. Yes, of course it is. Uh, didn't I say that? Yes, well, let, let, let's, let's get on with it, Mr. Rampour. I wish to make an application concerning this exhibit, my lord. Oh, very well. Make it, then. I would like to apply to the court for permission to open this bottle of alleged Cheval Blanc. You're not serious. Well, your lordship seems to have the possibility in mind. Mr. Rumpel, from time to time, the weight of these grave proceedings at the Old Bailey may be lifted when the judge makes a joke. One doesn't do it often, one seldom can, but one likes to do it whenever possible. I was making a joke, Mr. Rumpel. I am sure the court is most grateful for your honor's levity, but I am entirely serious. Uh, my learned pupil, Ms. Probert, has come equipped with a corkscrew. Mr. Rumpel, may I get this quite clear? What would be your purpose in opening this bottle? For the purpose of tasting the wine, my lord. Mr. Rumpel, this is a court of law. This is not a bar room. I have sat here for a long time, far too long in my opinion, listening to your cross-examination of this unfortunate gentleman who has, the jury may well find, suffered at the hands of your client. I am not prepared to sit here while you drink the exhibits. Not drink, taste, my lord. And may I say this, that if the defence is denied the opportunity of tasting this exhibit, this vital exhibit, I shall have to apply immediately to the Court of Appeal. Court of Appeal, did you say? Court of Appeal, my lord. You would take this matter to the Court of Appeal? This very afternoon, my lord. That's what you do? Oh, without hesitation, my lord. <clears throat> um, uh, what do you say to that, uh, Mr. Tristram Paulet? My lord, I'm sure the court would not wish my learned friend to have any cause for complaint, however frivolous. And it might be better not to delay matters by making an application to the Court of Appeal. Exactly what was in my mind, Mr. Tristram Paul. Very well, Mr. Rumpel. In the quite exceptional circumstances of this case, the court is prepared to give you leave to taste. Of course, I shall invite your lordship and my learned friend to join me. Uh, my lord. Was there something you wish to say, Mr. Vandal? No. Uh, no, no. Yes, an all too familiar taste, and to those of a cultured palate demanding an immediate visit to Expectoration Corner, Chateau Thames Embankment 1986, a particularly brutal year. Mr. Rumpel, are you saying that this claret is not what it pretends to be? Exactly, my lord, and I shall be calling evidence on the matter. No doubt you will do that in the course of your defence, which will be... Uh... <sighs> Tomorrow morning, then, Mrs. Jury. Rumpel has got a pupil. I hope he's an apt pupil. But isn't he? It's a she. A she? Oh, really, Rumpel? Yeah. A Miss Liz Probert. You call her Liz? Oh, no. I call her Miss. And, uh, is she a middle-aged person? Oh, about 24 is that middle age these days. And is Hilda quite happy about that? Oh, Hilda doesn't look for happiness. Oh, what does she look for? The responsibilities of command. Oh, excuse me. Hello, yes. Yes, Rumpel speaking. Easton. Ken Easton. Oh, you work for Vanbury's. Of course, you were the poorer in the blind tasting contest, weren't you? This Liz Probert, Hilda. Aren't you curious to meet her? No, 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 not particularly. That's interesting, Mr. Easton. That's very interesting indeed. Thank you for ringing. You've been most helpful. No, you don't have to. All right, bye. bye. I'd like to get take the bus. Oh, yes, indeed. You look extremely fond of yourself, Rumpel. No doubt he is full of himself. With a young pupil to trot about with. Dodo will be coming down to the Old Bailey tomorrow, Rumpo. She's tremendously keen to see you in action. You've come to see him in action? Yes. Mr. Rumpole in, Diane? No. 
He's, he's round the corner. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He's out having his breakfast, preparing himself for the labours of the day. I'll show you where to go. Well, my next case. Matrimonial quarrel. The husband puts his hand out to stop his wife leaving home. Accidentally, oh, quite accidentally. He got the vagus nerve in her throat. That's the way he can stop somebody's heart. Without really meaning to. But didn't they teach you that in the bar exam, Miss Privet? No. Just about there on you, Miss Privet. Yes. Oh, shall be downstairs and I'll find you up here. I'm Lizzie's father, Probert. Of course. Yes, I am delighted to meet you. Delighted. Please sit down. Do sit down, please. Please sit down. Do. Do. <laughs> I should have realized. You're in mufti. What? Your collar. What's wrong with my collar? Nothing. Nothing at all. I'm sure it's very comfortable. Are you Miss Honoria O'Sullivan Burt? I am. Are you a grand maîtresse de vin? And for the past 15 years, have you been wine correspondent to the Sunday Examiner of Fleet Street, London, EC4? That is so. Miss Burt will be handed a glass with some wine in it. <laughs> Would you please taste it? Yes, painful though it may be, you'll have to swallow it, Miss Burt. We have no expectoration corner here. He's going to lead the witness? Oh, certainly not. In your own words, would you describe the wine you have just tasted? Is it worth describing? Oh, my client's liberty may depend upon it. Uh, it is rough, and I would say crude, Bordeaux-type wine of mixed origins. It may well contain some product of North Africa. Have you met such a wine before? I believe it is served in certain bars in this part of London to the more poorly paid members of the legal profession. Would you uh, price it at 50 pounds a bottle? <laughs> You're joking. Well, it's not I that made the joke, Miss Bird. It would be daylight robbery to charge more than two pounds. Two pounds. Thank yes. you, Miss Bird. Oh, just wait there a moment, please. Miss Bird, the wine you have just tasted came from a bottle labelled Chevelle Blanc 71. I take it that you don't think that is a correct description? Certainly not. What a blind tasting of Mr. Banbury's shop. Did you not identify a bottle of Chevelle Blanc 71? Um, yes? I... Did you not? I had my doubts about but it. But did you not identify it? Yes, I did. Thank you, Miss Bird. Miss Bird, on that occasion, were you competing against a Mr. Monty Mantis, a garage owner of Luton, in a blind tasting contest? Yes, I was. And did Mr. Mantis express a poor opinion of the alleged Cheval Blanc? He did. And were you encouraged by various hints and clues to identify it as a fine claret by Mr. Vanbury? Yes, sir. He was trying to help me a little. Yes. To help you, call it Cheval Blanc. I suppose so, yes. Miss Bird, looking back on that occasion, do you think you were tasting genuine Cheval Blanc? Looking back on it, my lord, I don't think I was. I must say, I'm a tremendous admirer of your work. Are you really? I thought you lawyers were always right. Not always. Some of them are entirely wrong. But there are a few of us prepared to fight the good fight. On with the revolution. You think it needs that? To awaken a real sense of morality? Don't you? The revolution. In our whole way of thinking. I fear so. I greatly fear so. Fear not, brother Ballard. We're in this together. 
Of course, yes. Uh, brother, were you in some Anglican monastic order? Hmm? <laughs> Only the clerical workers' union. <laughs> clerical workers, that of course, yes. <laughs> Amusing way of putting it. <laughs> Most of them weren't exactly monastic. <laughs> oh dear, yes. There's been a falling off, even among the clergy. We had a few Cheval Blanc 71 in the cellar, then this new consignment arrived. A new consignment from one of your usual sources? No, I didn't know where it came from. Uh, did Mr. Banbury give you any specific instructions regarding the new consignment? Yes, he asked me to move it to the other side of the cellar. And did you put it all there? No, I had started to unpack one of the cases and put a few bottles in the old Cheval Blanc bin. And what happened to the other cases, those you had not unpacked? They were the ones that were stolen. Tell us, Mr. Easton, what was Mr. Vanbury's reaction when told of the burglary? He seemed quite calm about it. He said, oh well, it's all insured. Mr. Rumble, I'm not absolutely sure that I followed the effect of the evidence we've been calling. If Mr. Vanbury were in the business of selling the inferior stuff we have tasted and Miss Honoria Bird has tasted as highly expensive claret, surely the deceit would be obvious to anyone drinking it. Oh, my lord, I'm not suggesting that the wine was in Mr. Banbury's possession for drinking. Not for drinking? No, my lord. Well, what, what on earth was it in his possession for? He had it for stealing, my lord. And, uh, our Lizzie's doing well, is she? Oh, we had great hopes of her. A girl with her background. How could she go wrong? Ah! Uh, um, she's Miss Rumpole, a somewhat elderly member of these chambers. I think she may do him some good. Do him? Uh, perhaps he's mixed too long with the criminal classes, but Rumpole seems somewhat lacking in a sense of sin. He had it for stealing members of the jury. But the theft was as phony and as fraudulent as the wine itself. No doubt Mr. Vanbury had arranged for this cheap liquid inexpensive bottles to be taken away and disposed of. That was his plan and his intention. So that when my client, Mr. Timpson, bought the wine from a man in the Needle Arms, he was not buying or receiving stolen property. He was buying wine that was sold by its owner in order to defraud his insurers. Or whatever the position of anyone else in this court, my client has committed no crime whatsoever. You seem ready to follow yourself again tonight, Rumpo. I suppose you've won another case. Oh, yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> oh, for a draught of vintage that has been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth. Yes, yes. A crude Bordeaux type of mixed origins. On sale to the more poorly paid members of the legal profession. How true. <laughs> oh, dear. What have you got to <laughs> laugh at, Rumpo? Yeah, Ballard. <laughs> Your head of chambers. Yes. He met Miss Probert's daddy, Red Ron, and still thought he was some sort of Anglican divine. He even called him father. He went entirely by the name on the label, you see. Tasting of flora and the country green. I say it's remarkably quiet around here. I seem to miss the fluting tones of your childhood chum, old Dodo Macintosh. Dodo's gone home. Oh, why? She's disgusted with you, Rumpo. Dance and Provencal song and sunburnt mirth. As a matter of fact, I told her she'd better go. You told her that? She said she'd seen you making up to some young girl in a tea shop. That's what she said. Well, I really couldn't imagine any young girl wanting to be made up to by you, Rumpel. I told you it was absolutely ridiculous. Thank you very much. <sighs> oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrene with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple stained mouth. She said that you were in some sort of embrace. Well, Dodo got it. Entirely wrong, haven't you, Rumpel? Oh, of course she got it wrong. She can't tell margarine from butter like you, Hilda. That I might drink and leave the world unseen and with thee fade away into the fire.
Scottish to you. Hilda, would you care to fade away with me into the forest dim? <laughs> Thank you.